Oh, you're going to sit there. I'm going to chat. We're going to chat. Yeah. Okay, so, excellent. So then I'm going to just turn this light. Yeah, Great. Right. So, hey, welcome everybody. I've got uh, Professor Tim Nugs here with me. Actually, I'm here with him. We're at the Institute of Sports, Sports Science here in Cape Town, right next to the Newlands uh, Rugby Ground. And uh, I've come here to, to talk to Professor Nugs about um, a number of things, actually. Um, and the first thing that I'd like to, to talk about is the clinical trial that you're starting to set up um, into the effects of this carbohydrate restriction on diabetes and that. So I'd like you to tell us a whole lot more about how that's going and, and what your plans are for that. Sure. So Doug, I think the evidence now is that you can reverse or put into remission type 2 diabetes. There's plenty of evidence in the literature, and provided you eat a low carbohydrate, high fat diet. Yeah. The question is how does it work? And no one's really shown that yet. And so our goal is to take people who have type 2 diabetes and initially we're going to look at people who have reversed their type 2 diabetes and we're going to do a very small pilot study of about four or five of them and we measure everything in their body in a detail that's never been done before because okay. over the years when I was studying athletic performance and carbohydrate replacement and fat loading and so on we developed the techniques to look at the whole body metabolism in a way that few labs in the world can do. And since then we've added a couple of other techniques. We can now look at liver glucose production, which is critical in diabetes. And we can also look at mitochondria in the muscle and see exactly what fuels they are burning. And so now we can combine all this and look at uh, people with type 2 diabetes. So the first pilot group we're looking at is people who reverse their type 2 diabetes. Right. So we know that they don't have type 2 diabetes anymore. And we're going to see, are they normal? And then we're going to challenge them with carbohydrates over a few days and see if they actually reverse to the full-blown diabetic state again, as we suspect they will. So in other words, that they're okay coping with a very low carbohydrate diet, but once you reintroduce carbohydrates, they go bad again. Okay. So that's the first very original trial, just to get our feet wet, so to speak. And then we're taking 40 people with type 2 diabetes, and we randomize them to four different groups. And we're putting them on a low. We're putting half of them on the low carbohydrate diet, and we will evaluate them in exactly the same way. We will measure everything in their body, how it functions, before they go on the trial, and then after six months or a year, we will repeat the studies, and we will see how they compare to people who don't reverse the diabetes, who continue to eat the high carbohydrate diet, who continue to be treated in the conventional way. And we hope to be able to show that this is exactly what happens when you reverse your type 2 diabetes, or conversely, what happens when you are type 2 diabetic and you start to eat a high fat, low carbohydrate diet. Why does it work? Why does it reverse or put some people into remission, but others it can't? What's the problem with some people like myself who couldn't reverse their type 2 diabetes? You still need to take medication. But is your medication reduced from what you were taking before, or is it? Is, are you My control is almost perfect. So now I've got an HbA1c of 5.5, which is, I'd, I'd like it to be 5, but it's 5.5, which for a diabetic is pretty good. Right. And so I take my metformin. But I bet just this morning, and that's what's so exciting about being in this field, there's a, a young doctor in Cape Town who also has type 2 diabetes, and he decided that he needed to treat some other condition, and he suddenly discovered that his metformin and this other particular drug have dramatically improved his control, so he's got normal control. And uh, he then went to the literature and found that these two drugs, which are prescription drugs, are known to interact, but no one uses them. So it's always exciting. So I'm hoping that this kind of same is going to happen to me, so that I'll get my HbA1c down to 5, as he's done with the combination of metformin right. plus this. I'm not going to tell you what drug it is at the moment, because we've got to study that as well. <laughs> yeah, okay. but uh, the metformin that you're taking, are you yeah. taking the same amount that you were taking yeah. previously? Yeah. So you, and you it haven't actually reduced it? No, I haven't. But, hold it, but you must recall that, that I started taking the metformin after some time. I'd already been diabetic and my, he, my HbA1c was oh, well over the 6, so 6.3, 6.5. Okay. So I've dropped that to 5.5 on metformin. Metformin is not a fantastic drug. That, it, it drops your your blood glucose about 0.5 millimoles, but the, the low-carb diet drops it dramatically. Right. So I don't know what my glucoses were doing when I was diabetic with a high-carbohydrate diet. They were much higher than, than they are now. So the big effect was the low-carb diet. And do you think it's um, just certain people, or do you think it's more that 
where you've had diabetes for a while and your pancreas is actually yeah. damaged and that's yeah. maybe why you still I'm need still secreting control. quite a lot of insulin, so but it just doesn't do it appropriately and still the insulin can't act. So I don't have a completely worn out pancreas. I do still able to secrete quite a lot right. of insulin. So, okay. But in fact, that's what you don't want to do. So you see, we focus too much on glucose in type 2 diabetes. Insulin is the problem. And, and I'm, I'm not so concerned that my HbA1c is 5.5 because I know that my insulin is low all the time. And it's the insulin that damages. So, so that, it, and so the, the, in, a, in a, m a measure where the HbA1c is actually an indirect marker of how much insulin you're secreting, uh, paradoxically. Okay. So if you've got an HbA1c of 6.5, it means you're secreting a lot of insulin. And it's the insulin that's okay. killing you n rather more than the high glucose. That's how I see it. Right. Because I, I, I notice that it's very difficult to get your fasting glucose down if you're type 2 diabetic, in my case that the one time your glucose is high is in the morning and, and why should that be? You haven't eaten and you've been resting, etc. And it's because of this unopposed glucagon action of the other hormone. And that, that's the real problem in diabetes is glucagon. Okay. The glucagon drives the glucose elevation and, and the insulin can't act against it because the insulin is not working properly in our livers. So, but the key is it's, it's okay to have a, a high fasting glucose if you're not eating carbohydrates. It's, it's the high fasting glucose plus the high carbohydrate diet and the high insulin that I think causes the damage. I may be wrong, but, but I think that, that, that we'll find that people on the low carb diet do well because they keep the insulin down, even if the glucose is still a little bit elevated. Oh, okay. And the, the trial itself, in terms of uh, the uh, timeline, what, what are your, when, when are you kind of expecting to well, we're shock the world with your results? Yeah, <laughs> it's probably be two or three years. It's going to be a long time. Okay. But we don't have to wait that long because I know the Verta Health Program mm. by Sami Inkinen, that will have results by December this year. And then we'll really see high rates of diabetes in remission on people on low carb diets. And yeah. that's going to be the game changer. We're just adding the cherry on the top to show you how it works, how that particular diet works. Okay, cool. So um, the next thing that I wanted to talk to you about was uh, your Eat Better South Africa program. Um, I know when you first introduced this whole concept of banting, as, as they call it here in South, in South Africa, the low carb, high fat diet, that uh, you ran into a little bit of uh, uh, problem where people were saying that oh this is a for the elitist you know the rich people and whatever and um, you decided to take it on and show that uh, the poorer communities are, can can quite easily do this as yeah, well correct. and so you um, tell us a little bit about these pilot programs I know that uh, the people from your foundation are going to take us around to one of the townships Kailicha when we finished here yes, and we're going to go and have a look at what they're doing there but I, um, if you could just tell everyone what, what that that program entails it should sure. be pretty cool so when the Noakes Foundation started our, our focus really was on the science that's what we thought was important to try to prove to people that there is science behind the low carbohydrate diet and I wanted to put funds into that and then one day Eodia Sampson came along and she's a, a very popular TV actress in South Africa very well known and she said you know I want to convert my community because she would converted to the low carb diet and she said it's my community that are really struggling and so she took us to her community and she said, right, look, this is the population. Yeah. I've got 30 ladies here. They, they're from the fitness group. They've been doing exercise for years, but they still can't lose weight. How sh why don't we try to introduce them to the low-carb diet? And we did very successfully. And the results were dramatic because the diet of these people is so poor. Yeah. It's so full of sugar. And once they understood and started to look at a cheaper way of eating, but healthy, it went dramat it worked dramatically. So they're actually eating even cheaper than they were yeah. than they were, than the previous really bad diet that they Correct. were before. Correct. Correct. And and one of the keys wow. was that they gained control of their health for the first time. So this is a community that has been marginalised in South Africa in a way only South Africans could have done it. So they were not only were they poor, but they had no control over their lives. And all of a sudden, these ladies said, "You know, for the first time in my life, I'm taking control." I remember one lady called me aside and she said, you know, Prof, my whole family had diabetes and I know what diabetes is. You become blind, you get renal failure, you lose your limbs. 
And I was petrified of going to the doctor because I knew that was the way I was going to go. I could see I was getting diabetic. I was putting on weight. I was getting lethargic and all these other things. And she said, I didn't want to go to the doctor to be tested. And we told, well, you've got diabetes. There's no hope for you. But she said, you've given us hope now. And she went on the diet. Her glucose control improved dramatically. Now she knows, as long as I do this, I'm not going to get type 2 diabetes. The other ladies told us that you know they would go once a month to get their pills from the hospital to treat their diabetes, their high blood pressure, etc., their gout. And they'd come home with a bag of tricks and called a party pack. Yeah. And they said, you know, this party pack doesn't work because I've been doing it for 20 years. Yeah. I waste one day a week where I could be working. She said, now, after a few weeks on your diet, a few months, I don't need the party pack anymore. So pretty much all of those drugs are gone. Oh, they're all gone. And, and that's... And th so what I realized was that the pharmaceutical industry is raping these communities. Absolutely. That, yeah. That's what it's doing. And we're allowing it to happen. And we have to educate the people to show them that they can eat healthily, they can afford to eat healthily, and then they don't need all this, this medication. And we can reinvest the money that was going out of the country to the pharmaceutical companies, reinvest it in those communities and build them up. But, okay, so now, now we've got a couple of pilot programs mm -hmm. going on. How do you envision kind of getting it now to the masses? We show, you show that it works. Yeah. How, how do you t tell everybody else, get everybody else to follow suit? And well, do you have a plan there? There's so much resistance, you see, because what I learned with my trial is that government, academia, and industry are tied together. And you have to break that, that, that combination, and it's very, very difficult. And we have to work from the people. We have to just drive the people to show them that it works until they demand change and they demand proper foods. So, so just keep growing those, those pilots into correct. bigger and bigger things yeah. until it attains critical mass at you, some point. You know, the, I'm sure you know there's the Banting Seven Day Meal Plan Facebook page in South right, Africa, right, yeah. which has now 600,000 plus people and it's growing by like 2,000 a day. 2, but the key is that 80% of those are Khoza or Zulu speaking black South Africans. I don't like to use the word black, but I think you, that black. we know what I mean. Those are Khoza and Zulu speaking South Africans. Right. 80%. So what have we broken? We've broken out of the white community. This high class yeah. Bishop's Court, Constantia community. And we work getting into the working class and that's what's really exciting. That is really They're driving yeah. it. And they, they've not been hoodwinked over the... Well, sorry, they have been hoodwinked. You see, they, what, one, one guy told me, he said, you know, I thought that eating Kellogg's cornflakes was made me more white, you see, and that was good. And now he realizes, my gosh, that's not good. Uh, that, that's the worst. So, <laughs> you know, there's such a movement in South Africa to, to get rid of colonialism. But this is the colonial diet. We've got to get rid of it. We've got to get back to eating what we always ate hundreds or thousands of years ago. Not even that though. I'm thinking back when I was a, a kid yeah. and I remembering what was in my mom's fridge, you yeah. know. Um, That's right. She had like the lard that was left over in a, in a dish in the yeah. fridge and stuff like that. And then this stuff came along and she was told that this was gonna, she was going to kill her family if she... You know, we, exactly. all, and then all that stuff went and suddenly we were eating cardboard. Yeah, exactly. You know, and um, it's just... For us, it's so exciting to be able to actually eat stuff with flavor now again. And, <laughs> and I, we always, we can't understand how people say how difficult it is because it's just the, um, okay, so we're not allowed to eat rice and pasta, but there's like all these brilliant things that you can eat now. It's, uh, I don't get it. No, Why precisely. is it so difficult? No, precisely. It's you crazy. know, I was fortunate to, to grow up in Zimbabwe in 1949. And I mean, where was there going to be commercial foods or industrial foods there? They just didn't, they couldn't get through to Zimbabwe, and that's how I was raised on animal produce, and just yeah. so fortunate. I was, I was, I was born there too, I yeah. moved down to South Africa when I was 14 or something. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I remember those fridges that I remember were up there, you know, and exactly. I mean, there was like meat and eggs and butter and all that stuff, and then suddenly and brains and was kidneys gone. and livers. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> My mom hated liver, but she still like knew that it was supposedly good for us, and yeah. so there was a day each week that we would have liver. She wouldn't <laughs> eat it, but we had to eat it. But uh, yeah, that was really cool. Fantastic. Um, so maybe then let's move on to the, the, the in endurance stuff. Yeah. Like that. Um, so there's a lot of talk about um, fat adaptation. I know Jeff Fowler did that faster study and he noticed that these 
well adapted athletes were generating like 50% of their energy from, from fat and that. But it more than 50, more well, like 90%. Well, right, time. but then, yeah. so the, what's the difference between, because now I feel like they're oxidizing the fat at that yeah. point, they're not actually keto adapted. Yeah. And I feel like there's a difference between being keto adapted and being like fat, uh, not fat adapted, but more effective at, burn yeah. at burning fat, you know, because that's, you've trained to be yeah. like that a bit, but you're not actually in ketosis and you're not keto adapted. And so what are your thoughts on, on that first of all? Is, is there a difference? And um, or, well, let's start there first. Yeah, those are, that's a really interesting question. Ketosis is a difficult state to get into. And I think that's probably one of the issues that there may well be additional benefits to being on such an extreme diet that you are ketotic all the time. Mm -hmm. And when, when I'm talking about ketosis, all of us on the low carb diet are running at a ketone levels of 0.6 millimoles per liter, somewhere around there. Right. But for most of us to get to three or four really takes a lot of effort. And you've got to cut the protein and you have to run a lot. I mean, I've got to run two hours a day to stay at three or four millimolar. Wow. And, and that's so that it's very difficult to, to sustain that. And I'm not sure it's all that necessary. And, and ketone bodies have additional advantages of no question for metabolic health. Right. But I'm not sure that they necessarily for performance. Okay. And I think that they probably work in the brain more than anything else because the actual actions in the muscle would seem to suggest they're not that good because they inhibit they inhibit fat oxidation and so on in the muscle, which is not quite what you'd want. Right. So there's this paradox which hasn't yet been resolved. So so let's get back to the point. I, to me, there's there's no debate. The majority of athletes are recreational athletes. That's 99% of athletes. Mm -hmm. They will do better on a low carbohydrate, high fat diet for their health and for their performance. For the elite athletes, the tiny, tiny, tiny percentage, there are some of them who will do best on very high carbohydrate diets, and there's some who will do best on a high fat diet with carbohydrate supplements when they're racing when they're racing so because i know there's a there's a facebook group called uh, keto adapted cyclist i don't mm. know if you yeah, if you I follow them right. that guys are are, are uh, really passionate yeah. about this yeah. but they're all doing these n equals one type yeah. experiments yeah. on themselves yeah. and yeah. trying um some of them are experimenting with you can some of them are experimenting with other types of yeah. uh, so they basically train lchf and then introduce some carbohydrates yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I get nervous that, that, you know, this thing about kicking you out of ketosis, so you, you eat some, you have a bad night and you eat a bunch of carbs and the next day your, your mm. ketone levels are much lower and all of that. So if you're going to do like a, 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 some, add some carbohydrates into your diet the night before the race or something, I feel like suddenly your metabolism is completely different now that, that when you get up and start and get on your, start your race, then all this time that you've been training in a, in a different metabolic yeah, state almost. Exactly. So well, we, we just completed a study on a guy who came to us and he wanted to know when should he take carbohydrates. And he raced, we had him do in the laboratory 20k time trials up to 100k time trials. And it was very, very clear the carbohydrates worked for the 20k's and that adverse effect 100k's. And they changed his metabolic metabolism, just a little carbohydrate ingested before and during inhibited fat oxidation and his fat oxidation came down substantially and our conclusion is that the carbohydrates work in the 20k but it can't be metabolic it has to be brain effect so that's where probably the carbohydrates are working they're actually stimulating the brain but then they have a negative component is that they inhibit fat oxidation right so where a vent is you just want fat oxidation like an Ironman triathlon I can't understand why you would want to take in the carbs except for the brain stimulating effect so that, that's, what, that's where the carbohydrates are working. And where we're getting confused is people are saying, oh, you see, you need the carbs in your muscles. But you have carbs in your muscles if you're fat adapted. Right. We've shown that. We published a paper in the Journal of Physiology showing that there's glycogen stores are half what they are if you're high carbohydrate. But you still got plenty of glycogen. There. Yeah, I remember seeing something Jeff Follick was, was saying. Like it, was, it was like he couldn't even really explain it. But so well, he, his data, really frankly, were wrong. And, and the Jeff won't mind me saying oh, okay, there we I go. reviewed his paper. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I said, I told him he was wrong because they discovered the fasting glucose, uh, glycogen was the same. 
It can't be. Yeah, because he said the glycogen stores were full, if yeah, I remember and correctly. And I don't but, but what I pointed out to Jeff was that when you made a calculation, he was up by about 50%. In other words, it was 50% more energy had disappeared than actually being he could account for. Okay. So there was an, an error on the original glycogen assay, and that can happen. And, uh, you know, that, but, but our data clearly showed that the glycogen stores are half. And when we did our calculation, they matched perfectly. We could account for every gram of glycogen that disappeared and every gram of fat that disappeared. It all was burnt. There wasn't this missing gap. So Jeff came up with some explanation <laughs> about where this missing energy had gone to. Okay. But, but I don't think that's true. So, so I think that time will show that your muscle glycogen stores are about half, but they are there and right. you can use them when you need them. So let's go back to our guy doing a 20K time trial. He's got plenty of glycogen. Why does he need sugar for a brain effect? Okay. And that, that in terms of just giving you the, the, uh, the motivation to keep racing yeah, when, exactly. when you feel like you're dying, that, that's where the, uh, augmenting that. Yeah. Uh, now, now the ketones may also work in the same way. And in fact, we're going to try and test that. Okay, so now that, that kind of leads me to, because we've got Jeff and Steve Finney, um, um, Gary Taubes is going to be at this event. And, and I'd love to sit down and talk with them about, okay, well, where's the next real trial or next study? What, what are we going to try and show now? Because it's all, so, all of this stuff is so new. Mm. I wish that we'd been studying this back when I was running Comrades 25 years ago, and then right. we could have, you know, we could have benefited from, from what they're learning. <laughs> um, well, the, the, what I'd like to do is to take people who are highly carb adapted and convert them and see what happens. Like take the Kenyans and put them on a high fat diet and see if they run faster. Because the presumption is that they won't. Right. But you see, uh, that's the one point. But the second question is the athletes who feed back to me who are involved in competitions every week, not once a year like running the Comrades. Right. We're playing a rugby match or a football game every week, right. weekend. They benefit because they recover more quickly and they have fewer injuries and the insulin resistance goes away. And the diet quality improved dramatically. We just converted a, a tri an Ironman triathlete who came fourth in the South African competition in, a, in his best time ever. Interestingly, he said it took me 12 weeks, but for the first 12 weeks I struggled. And then suddenly I converted, and four weeks later he did his best time. And he finished the course, the marathon, he ran at 2.47, which is pretty good. It was his best time by four minutes, and he's a really good athlete. Does an eight-hour Ironman, which says, you know, he's a He's a pretty good athlete. Pretty good, and he yeah. said it's just dramatic. But he showed me his diet before he changed. And it, it was full of rubbish. You know, the Cokes yeah. and the chips and the chocolates. Yeah. And they think that you can get away with it. You can't get away it's with it. It's not even diet. a matter of thinking you're getting away with it. You actually, because I would, I, yeah. that's what I used to eat yeah. before yeah. I started doing this. And it's like, I thought that this was helping me. So it wasn't exactly. like I was thinking, okay, well, I can get away with it because I run. And I yeah. thought this is helping me to exactly. do better. Exactly. And that, I mean, Pam will, will uh, attest to this. We work with a, um, a running club to help them train for the Rock and Roll Marathon in San Diego. And um, they are the hardest people to convert. Yeah. The runners are so brainwashed yeah. about um, the fact that you have to have carbs or you can't perform. And to try and find people, like you're saying, to, to do this study and, and yeah. to believe that it's worth trying. Uh, that's now Gatorade that's has done a selling. brilliant job. Jeez. Gatorade and, the, and Powerade and all those people, they've done a magnificent job. Yeah. And so that, that's the problem. And it's just so sad that people don't understand. You can't abuse your body with all that carbohydrate. We're just not designed for it. So, that, that would be, so those would be some of the studies I'd like to do. The, the one would be to, to study people doing regular competition and see if they convert, do they play more? To, are they less injured? That, that's what people will find. And it's really interesting. I work with uh, one of the leading rugby players in the world, David Pocock, who's from the Wallabies, and he was a former captain. And he says, you know, I deal with these other large guys on the team who eat the carbs. And he says, every day, the coach and the manager, the, the fitness consultant comes out and chases these poor guys. And because they're fat, you see, they've got to lose weight. <laughs> yeah. And he said, but if only they'd learn, they'd just have to change their diet, they wouldn't have to do all that extra exercise, there we go. which isn't helping them anyway. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, that leads me on to, so when I first got introduced to this, um, I started 
I learned about it and, and eventually decided to try it because it explained all the problems that I was having. It explained all the problems I had when I was when I was 20 years ago when I was running comrades, you know. So so we started doing the diet, but I'd never heard um, of banting. I mean, you know, let's. I mean, you you were my hero. The law of running was was my bible, <laughs> and. Um, but then I'd moved to San Diego and I'd kind of lost touch with, with what was going on in South Africa. Yeah. And I hadn't heard about your transformation and banting or, or any of that stuff. And, um, and so then we started doing it and started seeing these dramatic results. Mm -hmm. And the one day I was talking on the phone to my mom. One Sunday we were calling her and we finally kind of admitted, fessed up that we were, we were doing this like three or four months down the line. And we started telling her about it, all, all excited now because, you know, we were, um, we were seeing such good results. And she says, oh, that sounds like the Tim Knox diet. <laughs> and I just think, what? <laughs> so, like, we run and fetch a laptop while we're still talking to her, you know, and, like, looking it up, and I, and, and I learned all about this. Um, and it, it suddenly made, made the whole thing a whole, um, it gave it a whole lot more significance to me. Um, let and me then just I make, the make the point that Jeff, I changed because of Jeff Bowdoin's Yes, book, I remember uh, your story that it was Jeff and, and Steve Finney that, that and, book. and Eric Westman. Yeah. It was their book that converted me. So, yeah, so a huge, huge thank you to them for saving my life. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and then for converting South Africa to this bad day. They they're accountable. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> they're all going to be at our, at our yeah. event in August as well. So then I, I saw that video that you made where you were tearing those pages out of that <laughs> book that was my Bible, right? Um, so... The, the question I really was, was going to say is, all right, now we're going to go and run this race fat adapted. Mm -hmm. We eat completely differently. We don't do carbs anymore. So what are your three days before the event look like now in terms of what should you be eating for, for the average guy, not for these guys that are maybe going to introduce a bit of carbs or something mm -hmm. into, um, in, into the, their race plan. Um, for the average guy who's completely keto fat adapted and he's going to run that way, what should he do? in terms of his nutrition for the three days before the race, now that he's not carb loading. Yeah, well, I would hope that he has been training or she has been training and not eating any carbs when they were training, so right. that they were going Yeah, so assuming that yeah. that's the case, right? It just goes the same, and if they get hungry on the race, have a stop and have a meal. I mean, I'm being facetious now, but, but if you're going to run for eight hours, you've missed a meal, so stop and have a meal. I can remember, obviously, as you do, remember running comrades and running past where they were brying bourgeois, they were barbecuing bourgeois or sausage on the side of the road and always wanting to stop even though I was running so the time the smell was, like the really smell was amazing <laughs> yeah. and you, you, I couldn't understand but how can I be appealing that can be appealing to me yeah. when I know it's carbs I need and I've never but it wasn't got carbs that you, know, you just didn't know that yeah. right. and then Bruce Bordas used to tell me that when he finished the, he'd always reward himself with a steak at the end of the comrade that's what I used to do yeah. first thing with guys nearest steakhouse after the race so and go and, and grab a steak yeah. oh, just a pity we didn't understand it I must tell you, you know, that Bruce converted, Bruce Bordas converted. Yeah, no, I've, I've seen that stuff. I heard he ran two oceans on, he was bragging that he just ran it on water. That's right. Which is one of the things that made me want to ask you about that. What's your thoughts on uh, this adding carbs in for racing? Because Bruce is saying, like, I, I run on water now. Yeah, so. no, that you, you don't need it, except for, if, except for the mental stimulation, if you get bored or something. But metabolically, it will inhibit fat oxidation to a, li to a limited extent. Right. So, so that's the negative side, but the positive side is that it does give you a mental lift. Okay. But then that's the addiction, you see. So what happens when we run the two oceans? We come across the line and what do they offer you? Sugar-loaded drink. Yeah, exactly. And that just kicks off the addiction again. And that's what they want us to do. Okay, so uh, there were, there's a couple of other things. Um, one was something about malaria. And the other thing was that uh, I, Pam talks about something that you said that um, really influenced us to, to do what we do now. And um, I can't do it justice, so I would like to get her to actually tell that story. And then she has a question for you about uh, something that she's read about malaria. So sure. I think that's sure. a... Yeah. Switching? Yeah. Okay. Wow. So let me, just, let me just tell you, start by telling you what a privilege and an honor it is to be here with you today. It's so exciting to us because we've been so inspired. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Doug's told a story about you know not knowing what a 
low carb, high fat diet was, what a ketone was, what a ketogenic diet was, and had studied it over the summer, got into the fall, had that conversation with his mom. Mm -hmm. Then he started researching more and looking up what your work was and your videos and things and um, saw more of the low carbs down under in the low carb South Africa conferences and watch Serial Killers, the movie. <laughs> now, at the end, I think it was the first one? Yes, there was. With Donald? That's right, two out the pages. Yes. And then at the end, you said, we're changing the way the world eats one meal at a time. And I just felt so inspired, like, I want to be a part yeah. of what can we do to help that. We were already, you know, telling our friends and our family all the differences that we saw what we learned about how it can make people healthier. Mm -hmm. um, but it's such a 1% conversation of who will, you know, who's listening to mm -hmm. how can we make changes. So we had had maybe a year, some previous planning, conference planning experience. And we also wanted to touch our friends and family. So the community and our friends and family. So twofold, Doug had thought, well, maybe we could try to be coaches, you know, make it an official coaching. Um, and there was a program with um, RMR for coaching. So That's he right. applied for the coaching program, and he had actually gone through that whole online program of what is the LCHF diet, what do you eat, how do I implement it, what do I do at the grocery store, what's allowed, what's not allowed. And after he applied for the coaching program, they said, sorry, we've got everybody that were doing the initial time. And maybe in the background they were saying, since you're international and in, in the States, we're not quite ready for that. So Doug, Doug and I said, and mostly Doug said, well, I'm going to create something myself mm. from scratch, an online program to teach people. Because he's already been trying to teach a few people in our running club and our friends and family and telling them how it had affected us. And um, built from scratch, coaching program to say, all of the things, all of the above. How do you start? What do you eat? What do you not eat? What does it do? How do you implement it? You know, all the ease of grocery shopping and the brilliance of the food. Um, little bits of what are the recipes, you know, that that's, can go into a lot of work. But started that and then at the same time, Doug had just turned 50, knew that he had lost 35 pounds. Easily, you know, men do it much easier <laughs> than women do. I was up 15 pounds off. <laughs> Um, and had a conversation of, you know, what else can we do to help and how have we been inspired and how have we been inspired by the work that we read from Jeff Follett and Steve Finney and um, the um, your Against the Grains uh, mm -hmm. article and Grain Brain from David Perlmutter and all of the above. Since we have some conference planning experience in our head that we've just been doing over the last few years, Maybe we could invite everybody to come to San Diego. Mm -hmm. We could host them. And they could have a platform to continue to teach live in person to um, an audience. And we found we just started it. We just decided overnight yeah. that we were just going to write to a few people and see if they would come. And more people said yes. And then every time we spoke to someone, they said, you need to speak to someone else and invite them. And they <laughs> said, OK, we'll come as well. And then people started buying tickets. So, yeah. you know, we posted it and said, okay, we've had these people agree to come. Um, we're going to plan the conferences. Please come and join, join the community and hear them speak. And we found that the first one was completely amazing. It far exceeded our expectations of how it was received. Mm -hmm. Building the community. But people wrote to us and said, I feel like the rock stars that I've been watching online are coming <laughs> to town. But not only because they're, they're rock stars to the people, because they've changed their lives. Mm -hmm. And you probably hear people write to you every day. How you, like you said to uh, uh, Jeff and Steve Finney about how they changed your yeah, life. Right. It makes such a difference to people because sure. their medical doctor is telling them one thing, like your, mm -hmm. the community you're just speaking about, who year after year after year, they continue to eat one way with the carbohydrates and then take the medicine and they're still sick. Mm -hmm. So. Everybody is just um, so appreciative of the work. And the hotel staff yes. at the places that we've gone, we've done two now, yeah. one in 
the east coast of the United States and Florida and one on the west coast in San Diego. And the hotel says, your group is so fun and so easy to work with. I said, that's because eating high fat and low carbs and getting healthy makes people happy. <laughs> that's <laughs> true. They said, we can't tell you. We've worked with so many groups and your group is just so Fantastic. It's interesting. It's an interesting observation. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, very interesting. They were so appreciative of all the groups they've ever had. They reckon by far the best group. Yeah. yeah. You know, they provided yeah. a really wonderful meal, low carb. We worked very closely with the chefs to do meat and veg and cream and no sugar and low fruit, you know, maybe some berries, a whip, a lovely whipped cream dessert with berries. No sugar, you don't need it. Maybe a tiny bit of sweetener. That's another conversation about, you know, the artificial sweeteners, how, how they affect people. But, and they were just so amazed that everybody was so happy. And, <laughs> you know, if you have cream for your coffee and no sugar and no muffins, but other things that we're all very happy knowing that that's going to improve our health, but we also enjoy what we're eating. So anyway, we just wanted to tell you how much you've inspired us as a, as two people on the ground to figure out what we could do mm -hmm. to help the movement and build community and help the health globally of everybody. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And I know my wife will also appreciate that because we've been through tough times in the last yeah. three years. <sighs> and uh, it's, it really makes it worthwhile when you realize how many people are being affected in a positive way. No, so thank you for that. Yes, and um, our thoughts and all of our prayers are with you all the time through all this. And it must be really hard for you being in the spotlight and having all that discussion <laughs> come at you yeah. and not seeing how much you're truly helping because you're getting the negative mm. bombardment. And, but there are so many people who are so appreciative and it is helping. So yeah. as the word gets out of how beneficial changing diet is for so many different areas of health and chronic illness yeah. that are, I mean, the autoimmune disease and the growth of, the can of cancer more prominent, it's just yeah. going to yeah. continue to hopefully change that. No, indeed, and, and, and I think you know, the reason, only reason we've survived all of this is because of the public support, and if there hadn't been that public support, it would have been extremely difficult, and I think that's why this movement will win in the end, because the public are just taking it forward, and you can't suppress it any longer. It's gone beyond anything. The, you know, the trial against me was to try and suppress all doctors from exposing uh, these ideas on social media. Mm. That was the goal. They wanted to make every doctor so scared that he would not say anything or she would not say anything on social media mm. that might be slightly contentious. And they hoped to shut me up and, and shut down social media, but they failed. And it's not going to work. It's not going to work. It's and gonna work. it's just, they tried to put the stake in the ground and it just gets thrown out. And <laughs> they're not going to stop. And a lot, of doctors, in there again. You know, a lot of doctors have kept their heads below the parapet, but they now are practicing this way. And we just have to, that's another area we need to work on is educating doctors and yes. allowing them to feel confident with prescribing this diet. Yeah, so that, that's another point. Dr. Mm -hmm. Jeff Gerber has been a phenomenal yeah, help in absolutely. planning our conference yeah. um, and being, working behind the scenes to make it available for the continuing medical education credits to be available to healthcare practitioners and doctors mm -hmm. who come um, mostly from the states are probably going to be able to use those approved prescribed yeah. credits for their continuing medical education requirements for their licensing but they can come and learn from the experts and then receive so uh, you know an added incentive is that they're going to receive those credits towards their licensing but to hear the evidence-based science behind why would they, and why can they be safe mm -hmm. prescribing diet and lifestyle change? You don't have to prescribe food, <laughs> good food, right? It's not a prescription. So to have anybody be against telling somebody to eat better and eat healthier, 
yeah. because it goes against the grains of against the, the <laughs> right yeah. of the oh you know the healthy grains where people just aren't tolerating them because they've had so much sugar. Um, so I had a, a lovely letter from a South African doctor recently, and he told me that he works. He's from Johannesburg. He works in a practice with thirteen other doctors. He said he's the only one prescribing the Banting diet. He says he's got the most patients. He sees 30 or 40 patients a day and he just hasn't got time to accommodate all of them. And that indicates, he said, you know, that this is the change. And that eventually the other 13 are going to look at him and say, why are all the patients coming to see you, not me? Yes. And they'll suddenly learn, actually, it's because he's doing something positive for their health. Yes, yes. That reminds me, um, last week we were... Um, we went to a paleo conference in Austin, Texas. Yes. Um, we know a lot of the paleo community yeah. is cutting sugars and most yeah. grains and carbohydrates and leading with a mm -hmm. much healthier diet. They still allow a bit of the natural sweeteners, which if you're carbohydrate intolerant, we're learning that that's not going to be beneficial because the insulin levels are still going to be going up. But we went to share, you know, share that and um, our conversation invite them to come to the local USA conferences to hear more of the science, but um, there was a number of people who said, I tried to just do paleo, eat the natural sweeteners and some of the healthy carbohydrates, like the sweet potatoes, and I still wasn't able to address my autoimmune issues. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, I was still having symptoms, I uh, was still having symptoms with lupus, there was a couple mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. of these conversations, or, or the type 2 diabetes. Yeah. But there was a, um, a woman, she said, I was at my doctor's office and I saw a coupon for this medication and a coupon for that medication and another one. And I looked at him and said, where's your coupon to the farmer's market? <laughs> so the farmer's market in the United States is an outdoor mm -hmm. market yeah. where yeah. local people will bring their produce. Where's your coupon to the <laughs> farmer's market in your nutrition guide? And yeah. you know, so yeah. We'll have more help, hopefully, from the community of dietitians who maybe the doctors don't have the load to talk about food but um, they can have those programs put into place where they can. So just to change a little bit from that, that's going to hopefully continue to grow and be a more of a resource for people. But um, I just also, while we were here, I wanted to ask you, because last year, all of the articles that come up about LCHF cutting carbohydrates, I came across an article about malaria, which is a big problem here in Africa. It's not such a big problem in the States, <laughs> but you know. But for visiting, but I was wondering what your thoughts were on the um, the conversation that I read. It was an article about showing that the malaria is it a virus? Is malaria is a virus? No, it's a protozoa. It's a protozoa yeah. that um, a low carbohydrate diet didn't allow it to continue to grow, and the symptoms were um, almost gone away on a low carb diet. That, that's fascinating, but I'll just extend that. You know that tuberculosis, which is the oh, other so big killer in South Africa, yes. didn't exist in traditional populations eating their traditional foods. And of course then, when the white man arrived, of course they brought tuberculosis, but they also brought the diet. And it astonishes me that no one looks at nutrition and diabetes in tuberculosis mm. or HIV. And South Africa is a country where we should be looking at that, but no one does it. We have a unit a research unit at our university, 250 million rands a year, not one study on nutrition, trying to find out so solutions for tuberculosis and, and TB, but sorry, tuberculosis and HIV, not making massive changes. Mm. And no one thinks, why don't we just try a simple thing like diet? Now and that's interesting. What, do you yeah. think that they would see a positive change in HIV? I, I've Symptoms no, or growth I've no or doubt, conversion no to fats and cholesterol are what you need for immune function. Yes. And I, I'm sure it would have a massive effect. And again, that would be another clinical trial that would wow. be would be wor well worth doing. So that would keep them from converting over to full-blown AIDS, possibly. Yeah. By eating. Yeah, exactly. Wow. And you know, in South Africa, we all have to. We all carry tuberculosis, but but whether well, you have the symptoms or not. Yeah, you know, exactly. Those of us who live in the higher socioeconomic class, we don't present with tuberculosis because our immune function is good enough. Mm. But you've it's, all been exposed. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I mean there was a study done amongst children with vitamin A deficiency and measles. And if you've got vitamin A deficiency, measles is a catastrophic disease. Mm. They simply gave vitamin A to a population in Cape Town and the measles mortality dropped dramatically. Well what's vitamin A? Where does it come from? It's a high fat diet. 
But no one asked, well, actually, you don't have to give vitamin A, just give a high-fat diet. I, I remember when I was a medical student, we were taught it's useless to give a supplement. You've got to give the whole diet, but diet's the problem. Mm. But we seem to have forgotten about that now. Because now we, it's, oh, it's this pill or whatever, or yes. this supplement. It's yes. not, it's the diet that's, yes. that's going to change. So I, I, I'd be really interested about malaria, but I think it really applies to, to tuberculosis. And I, I think if you look back carefully enough in the literature, you'd find that there is some evidence that, that tuberculosis is much, much lower in people eating high-fat diets than it is in people eating the industrial diets. Wow, it's fascinating. Yeah. So who's going to have to implement all this? We can't, we can't all do it, right? There has to be a group. <laughs> we can't do everything. Yeah. But I'm, sure I'm sure there's a group of people. Well, who well, governments need to come on board. Yes. You see, see another point about, I spoke about the colonial diets. Now, maize is the colonial diet in South Africa, and yes. people don't realize it, but the, the Zulu and uh, Kwasa speaking South Africans, who are the Nguni tribe, who come from the north, yes. the Nguni were cattle people, they were cattle owners, and Shaka Zulu, the very famous uh, Zulu speaking person who developed the Zulu population, he had a special tri a group of Nguni cattle, and he had about 10,000 pure white cattle, and they, they loved their cattle. And the white man came along and exterminated all the cattle, as they did for the bison in North America. Oh, that's such a shame. And that, that was ethnic cleansing of the worst, worst. And then what happened? So we started to eat maize. We replaced meat with maize. Only in 1910, 1920 in this country. So maize is now the staple food, and no one will understand it's actually a colonial product. We brought it in from South America, and it was the white man's choice to to force it on our people. Yes, and it's barely been a century of exactly. and that extreme change from what people had been doing for centuries before. And I'm listening. I was listening to Leary Keith last night. She's this, the lady who was a vegan for 20 years, destroyed her health, and then she's written a book called The, the Vegetarian Myth. And she said that you look at all corn-based populations. In South America, there were many based on corn. They all collapsed ultimately because their health collapsed and then the soil collapsed. And we just, we won't address it. The only way we can improve the health of South Africans is to put cattle back on the menu and, and save the soil and stop tilling the soil and growing maize. Re re return it to cattle and, as it was or and turn North America back to bison yes. as it was and yes. then we'll solve the problems. That's, that's one of the key issues because ultimately the soil fails and then the civilization fails. Yeah. So we're talking about saving the future civilizations, not just our current health problems Sorry. here. That's a giant, giant um, conversation. Yeah. That's, that's actually pretty profound. It so. is. <laughs> it's frightening to understand that that civilization is doomed as long as we keep eating. Uh, cereals and grains because it destroys the land and eventually the land is finished. And coming from a culture who right now is thinking that we're all doing the best that we know yeah, from yeah. the information that we've had and feeling many people were starting to get really confident in where we were going but then you really look at the health issues and what you're talking about agriculture. Okay. All right, that's a very profound statement <laughs> of how, how what we need, we do need to work on. So, so that's it. Yeah, you know, we, we really want to thank you sure. for your time that you spent with us. We've had a fantastic time here in Cape Town visiting. It gave us a really good reason to come to Cape Town because last time I was here in South Africa, we were just in uh, Johannesburg and up where Doug's parents live in um, Natal. Yeah. Um, we had a beautiful time touring. And uh, one last thing, we actually had a chance to go to Constantia. Um, I guess it's not the Constantia Inn anymore, it's a La Prada. So Edinburgh. I want to know who had the, um, the power and the, uh, or maybe who, who um, I can't think of the word, um, inspired the folks there to create the menu that ha had all the LCHF <laughs> options on the menu. Um, I kept visioning Prof sitting at the table there and um, being able to <laughs> order all his LCHF food. Is it? I think it was just the people of Cape Town demanded yeah. it. Yeah. Yes, which is going to be what we have to do to get our yeah. restaurants to That's change. Right. We're really hoping in, in uh, the U.S. we'll have more options. You see the vegan and the gluten-free and yeah, exactly. sometimes paleo options. Yeah. Um, so to have LCHF on the menu um, is something that we're really hopeful to see because we always 
um, tweaking the menu options that's going out, and I think that's what people find hard hardest. Um, what are we going to eat when we go out? We love to cook at home now, yeah. but to make it easier, join other people and be social, just be able to eat out. So to have a cauliflower mash on the <laughs> on the menu and to have it highlighted that there's a, a a dessert that's LCHF that you know you don't have to worry is there sugar in it or you know what kind of mm -hmm. dairy are they using or you know if they're using the high fat dairy or butter it gives you confidence and it's pleasurable so yeah that's beautiful fantastic anyway, thank you so very thank much thank you for thanks man